so we're talking uh, tissue culture, and you said you've recently been dabbling in it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we, we hired a stem cell researcher about three years ago to go down the tissue culture route. Um, and we started with, um, it, by the way, it was a stem cell researcher in human stem cells. So he had to quickly learn tissue culture for plants, but um, it was the right person to do it. And they spent about six months developing tech. And, we went from uh, just, kind of just no quickly. Did, did he say anything that he learned that was different doing plant stem cell versus human? Uh, I mean, it, yeah, there's a lot of differences to it, but a lot of the protocols for clean room were very important. So having someone real familiar with clean room protocols, but in terms of, of yeah, the technology itself is a lot different. Um, but it started as just reading papers on the subject and then trying to replicate the studies. And then after that, it was, okay, let's do some real Start research. Start from scratch. <laughs> Start from scratch. That's it. There was, there was hardly anything on the subject. There's a couple of famously bad papers out there. Yeah, and that's what we started with. I'm sure you guys probably yeah. did the same. Yeah. But after about A lot of two, people want to strangle this lot of scientists. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it was like, do it from scratch, learn it, and then, you know, um, the conclusion that we came to in our I don't know, year and a half was that it's great for certain things, but for general propagation, you know, moms and cutting still seem to be the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'm curious to see kind of what you're. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, we started a lot. Wait, before he goes, ta talk about what you what was it good for in your scenario? Uh, so well, we were just starting to get into the research on cleaning up plant material um, and this is right about the time where we started to hear kind of um, noise about this, these mutations in OGs being an actual virus or a viroid but we, we didn't have any information and then it came out you know about a year and a half later um, you guys did some research right on I think the yeah. latent hemp was it the latent pop latent viroid, viroid yeah. right right uh, and we think there's probably others as well that we're, ah. that we're uh, exploring right now. So, okay. Uh, yeah, definitely the hop latent virus is a big target for us. Yeah. It still is, really. We're seeing it all over the place. Wow. And it's, as a cultivator, you know, I've been growing for, you know, 20 years now. Started to see those, like, real weird mutants in OGs and, like, any kind of OG-related varieties, it seemed like, at mm -hmm. first. And anything that we bred with them, sometimes they would pass through. Yep, yep. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting time. So there's there's been a lot of like crazy research in the tissue culture. But it's good to hear that you know some of the top guys in the game found the same thing we did. That putting tons of money into tissue culture for propagation might be kind of a bad move. <laughs> yeah, no, it was. Um, I mean, like. We were in the space like probably in like 2014 or so we started it. And it was funny because I was thinking back on this and for us it was, the big thing was like we were at the maximum of this indoor facility we have in Oakland, yeah. right? And we're like, how can we possibly make more plants? Yeah. Let's check out tissue culture. Because, you know, in tissue culture we're like, wow, you do the math, you can do like a million plants in right. 10 square feet, you know? Yeah. Um, and so we started exploring it, you know, we built out a lab and uh, same thing, did, yeah. you know, looked at the papers and um, never accomplished what the papers promised, but we actually did launch a commercial line of plants through tissue culture, scaled up the lab pretty aggressively. Um, we had this lab lit line of products that we did. Um, but then, you know, at the end of the day, you, you do the math and you're like, Jesus, our, our tissue culture plants cost X, or our regular plants cost X. It just, it just didn't, and then, you know, we, we would do trials as well. So there's this right. question like, are tissue culture plants higher quality, right? right. Are they more productive? Do, yeah. You know, they branch more. And every time we did a trial, we're like, Could, yeah. I don't know, they, right. it's pretty dang close either way. Close. It's pretty dang close. There's no, there's no clear, there was no clear advantage to tissue culture. So. Yeah. But like you said, I think what did become really important to us was, especially around what we call phytosanitation. Yeah. Right? And yeah, we saw, and frankly, like going back all the way, you know, for my whole 12 years in the industry, people have always talked about um, genetic drift. Right. Right. It's like, oh, genetic drift. Don't you notice that plants do worse over time? And I'm like, you know, like, as like, you know, my like inner geneticist tells yeah. me that that's not a thing. Yep. Right. Yep. But what could be happening is we've got these disease pressures, yeah. right? And we didn't know what they were, and frankly, we hadn't even seen them in symptoms at the time. Um, but we said, like, let's start figuring out, like, uh, phytosanitation, like, 
mirror culture techniques and, and like other like treatments to pair with that to eliminate viruses, viroids, and other pathogens. And uh, but it took like four more years before we like were really able to you know we really had to we had we had the phytosanitation stuff, but then we had to do the um, sequencing and diagnostic work to actually figure out what was in the plant. What were the culprits, right? Yeah. And the hot blade virus was just, that's one thing. Yeah, that was the biggest one. I mean, that's, that we're confident. We're, we showed like causality. We really went, uh, you know, Jeremy Warren, who's now our director of plant health, was really able to go all the way to identifying that, that causes the dudding uh, symptoms that we see. Yeah. Um, but we, you know, since we published that, we've had people come to us with other symptoms. Hey, what's this? What's this? And we're now seeing other symptoms um, that are not. They're probably not um, HPLVD, um, but we think they're probably something else. So we're going through a second a second set of sequencing right now. And we'll see what are some of the symptoms you're seeing? And yeah, I mean it, it's like all across the board. And Jeremy's really the best uh, to to explore this. But you know, frequently we'll see like um, varying leaf deformities are like really common, especially when they're like you know this is like kind of my like uh, farmer hat. You know, my farmer descriptions. Like you'll see. Um, leaves where they have like um, uh, asymmetric deformities, right? They'll, 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 they'll like curve, they'll have like various forms of modeling, mosaic-y type yeah, symptoms. Right. Kind of looks uh, like variegation, but it's not, right? It's yeah. like a weird, yeah, we have, I've seen that a lot, structural issues on the leaf where it's like half the leaf looks kind of deformed and it's not hop latent viroid, it's different than the diet. Right, right. Yeah, various forms of like even like um, various forms of leaf curving, right? Mm -hmm. Like leaf tacoing and stuff like that. Sometimes that's just nutrient, but other times it seems to be something else is going on there. So, um, yeah, whole plethora. Even like, you know, weird like foxtailing on flowers and stuff like that. It's funny because um, HPLVD we have found is very widespread. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, now that we've got that, and this is really the key for us, and what we've done with tissue culture is. Um, turn the lab into what we call our clean plant program. So we marry this tissue culture with the with the mirror culture and various pretreatments to get clean plants. But also, really importantly, we have the diagnostic lab, right? So we have to after we go through that process, we have to like run it through the lab to confirm that it is in fact a clean plant. And then, frankly, like in what we call our elite mom repository, routinely test to make sure yeah. that those plants have not become reinfected, yeah. right? Because, I mean, you, you really have to get rid of the viroid all the way throughout the plant, right? It can, it can hide in who knows where. You have a, a, a lower branch that has the hop latent viroid. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the uh, really surprising things is that this is like, you know, it's been described to me as like, you know, it's like you would be looking for one person on the planet Mars, right? Yeah. It's like potentially the scale you're dealing with. And even like with really precise uh, PCR diagnostics, like for us, we don't really consider anything clean until it tests clean three times consecutively with its screenings, right? Uh, because you get a lot of false negatives, even with really sensitive equipment. One thing that's interesting, we were able to reduce the dudding just by mom selection, mm -hmm. not even doing tissue culture, just really aggressive mom selection. You know, you take your thousand cuttings from your moms and then you take, you know, the top 30 and those become moms and then you do that generations and generations and eventually you're just kind of selecting towards vigor mm -hmm. and you could reduce it and we've seen that help a lot just statistically yeah 100 percent. like even the first thing we ever saw published on dudding um, i think it was uh, rick crumb uh, presented like at the uh, emerald conference years ago and that was like really best practice you know even before anyone knew what it was yeah. it was just like You're just doing it to do. just select <laughs> yeah. select 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 call call bad stuff select select and it's funny we still don't know enough about the, the viroid to like know exactly how that works but mm. yeah they do call it latent for a reason like yeah. it's it, it can exist asymptomatically and frequently does so you know presumably you just get the the pressure below a certain point or something like that you can yeah you can manage but <clears throat> that's a really good point yeah I mean we've noticed also it seems I mean this is just kind of observation that the environment and you know the way that you grow the plant can also influence how the symptoms affect the plant 
So maybe you know the, the, your your environment is on point, everything's perfect, lighting's perfect, client's super happy, and the the viroid doesn't affect it as much. It's something that's stressed. Yeah, no, like so. My version of that is like we we get we see many more symptomatic clients with indoor growers, mm -hmm. but like um, greenhouse and especially outdoor growers seem to have far fewer symptoms. And so, like, we don't know exactly what that is, but yeah. probably something environmental as well, right? Yeah, Either yeah. Hot and cold, or maybe it's the light or something. Or epigenetic, right? Is that epigenetic? Like the... I, I don't even know what I'm talking about. Yeah, well... Uh, <laughs> no, no, the epigenetic. So, I mean, I guess it's the um, the, the plant's ability to trigger certain, certain genes. Yeah. We've heard that with, like, outdoor growth forever. You put something that's indoor, it seems to be real weak out, and within, you know, a season, it, you can bring it back in, it's yeah. strong. And maybe it's UV light or you know something else, but yeah, yeah, it's really uh, Jeremy's uh, field of study on our team. But um, I do know like the plants do have a uh, immune response system. Yeah. So you know, if in an environment where that system can work better, it's gonna it's gonna be better at, at eliminating the pathogen itself. Yeah, I mean, I think just in general, indoor indoor environment is much more unstable than the outdoor environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although you can control it. But the stability itself is, is a lot different. It can be hard, yeah. Well, and it's just unnatural for the plant, right? There's stuff that doesn't doesn't always work the way the plant expects it to work. Yep. All right. What, uh, I just want to get back to the point, because when we were over there, before we came over here, it was, for us here, just specifically, like the three things, tissue culture is good. Like, like remember we talked about, like, keeping your library, right? Yeah. So can you just get into, like, like what it what do we use tissue culture for as a functioning grow operation and where is it not really relevant because then you got into like it's easy just to take a thousand clippings a week and right right yeah so for like prop propagation kind of just general production in a facility it seems like mom clone is still the way to go for cannabis at least right now uh when we did research on tissue culture the one, yeah, the one benefit we thought, and we didn't really get to test it as much as we wanted to, but it was if you are doing breeding and phenotype selection, storing those varieties, you know, it, it's a lot less space, you know, and you can store for quite a bit of time if you have the right technology. Yeah. But that's, you know, I still think there's a lot of research that needs to be done. You can probably speak on that more um, in terms of storage. Agree 100%. I mean, that's basically, you know, so that's for us. Uh, we have the clean plant program and we have the genetic library. That's, you know, it helps us. And, you know, it's the two combined for us is what's really important, yeah. right? We can take in new genetics, clean them up, add them to the library. We've got something like 100 varietals now at the lab, um, you know, which allows us to, to offer more interesting genetics more frequently and also to know that they're clean when we're watching the market, right? Have you guys um, done any long-term storage with cryo-freezing, or is it just kind of like freezing level, you know, zero degrees? Are you guys doing? We haven't, we haven't done any cryo-preservation stuff yet, yeah. but we have done a variety of like long-term storage protocols, which um, have been mostly successful for us, um, but never like the liquid nitrogen bath and stuff like that. Gotcha.